think that you know, we'll start again. <laughs> Sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> I was panicking that I was the only one that got booted out. But all right. So Tony, you want to pick up where you left off at this is an easy one? <laughs> oh, I wasn't going to say that again, Shauna. <laughs> Let me knock on wood. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so this this proposal, uh, proposal number 17. Uh, with section 907.6.4 of the amendments mm -hmm. would reintroduce back the concept of fire alarm zones in both the base code uh, in section 907.6.4 and NFPA 72 identify fire alarm zones or restrict fire alarm zones to no uh, larger than 22,500 square feet or 300 feet in any direction. And so this used to be in our amendments. And for some reason in 2016, it was omitted. Not sure why, but the proposal is to reintroduce it. Um, we've been enforcing it based on uh, NFPA 72 anyway. Thank you. Okay. All right. Anybody from the public wishing to speak on this? Anyone from the public? Don't look like it. All right. Committee. <clears throat> Quickly, anybody? Or a motion? I make a motion to submit as or to uh, accept as submitted. Okay. George, is there a second? Tony seconds. Tony? Okay. All right. Um, there's been a motion and a second for as submitted as for this proposal, as you see on the screen. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor of number 17 as submitted? Please raise your hand. It looks like all of those present, but we'll just go through the process. That looks like a vote of 10. And then any opposition? Any abstain? Okay, so it looks like we had everybody present. So uh, number 17 is um, as submitted 10 to zero. All right, perfect, yay. You were right, it was easy once we got through it. <laughs> All right, that brings up number P 10.2. And Shauna, there's a, that's not dot 10 in that, it's item 10 in the list. And this is in the current amendments, uh, but I've got the notes on that so that we get that corrected uh, at final document. Uh, can you what what are you talking about? Not in the number. The, oh, in the numbering. Here? Yeah, the numbering shows the final dot ten. Uh -huh. That's not actually a subsection dot ten. It is oh. item ten in the list. Oh, gotcha. Just clarifying so that for everyone. Yeah, item ten. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, okay, this is um, who? John, but I don't think John is here. Is there somebody to present this proposal? Yeah, this is Tony with Denver Fire. I can okay. present on John's behalf. Okay. And it's John McGovern, by the way. Just right. Under the record. And, yeah, is um, that right? I like what John's done. Uh, typically, in high-rise buildings, we use duct detectors at shaft interfaces as initiating devices to start the smoke control system. Um, so we use them as alarm points. And so all John's proposal does is recognize that those are alarming devices and not just supervisory devices. And we should enunciate them accordingly. All right, thank you. Uh, anybody from the public wishing to speak? Anyone from the public? No? All right. Committee? I agree with John's comments. It just adds to what we historically have done. I would just add that it could use a couple of comment or commas, but maybe, uh, Glenn, you could kind of do some wordsmithing with the commas there. Other than that, it's good. Okay. I agree. Commas, well. commas or parentheses, right, George? 
<laughs> I think it's commas, but yeah. <laughs> All right, we definitely will make sure of that. All right, well, then I would take a motion for as submitted. Make a motion to accept as submitted. All right, is there a second? Hey, Shauna, can you share the proposal on the screen? Oh, am I not? Sorry. I'm so sorry. Once we lost everything, I, uh, all this time I've been scrolling around thinking you guys are seeing what I'm seeing. How about now? <laughs> yep, we can see it. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. I think once I got booted out, it, I forgot to redo that. All right. So this is as submitted. Um, there's a motion, in, and I haven't heard a second. I have a second. OK. Cool. All right. A motion and a second for as submitted. Any further discussion? Seeing none. I will ask for a vote and it, and it really booted me out of everything. Okay, all those in favor of as submitted, please raise your hand. That looks like 10, everybody. So all of those opposed and all those abstaining, nothing. I think we have 10 voting members right now. So. All right, excellent. That is as submitted. Perfect. That brings us to item number 66. Sorry, my screens are all messed up. Give me one second to get to 66 here. All right, item number 66. This looks like Tony. So, Tony, you want to walk us through 66? You're, you're muted, Tony. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. This one deals with smoke control and verification of fan status. And I want to move from Appendix O, which outlines the submittal requirements. There are code provisions in that section that should really be in the content of the code. So I'm moving the underlying portions from the submittal requirements into the code requirements under verification. And this is, I mean, this is how we've been applying them. There's no change in how they be enforced or what we'd be looking for. It just puts them in the correct location. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Tony. Anybody from the public wishing to speak on this item? Anybody from the public? All right, committee, any discussion? What Tony has proposed here? Uh, I do have a question on item C. Um, where says fan fails to move air by program or switch. I, I don't know how you can really verify the, the movement of the air, basically. Uh, I know. Some have interpreted that you need to have a flow switch of some sort, but I've never seen any uh, airflow switches on any systems. Yeah, so so Mike, um, there is no code change. There's no language change. Mm -hmm. So this is how it's appeared, I believe, since the 16 amendments. Um, and that was written, written by John McGovern. And yeah. basically the, there's two methods. We can use the old style fan sail switches which you're right, we don't see anymore. Um, but we now nowadays more than likely either use uh, CT switches, current mm -hmm. transducers, or we use built-in transducers that come with the VFD uh, for positive confirmation. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's just the way it reads. Um, and I know it's been there. Uh, it reads like you need to have a flow switch of some sort. Yeah, and I, I think what John was trying to capture is if you go to the smoke control handbook, um, if you move too little air, you're supposed to send a trouble. If you move too much air, you're supposed to send a trouble. So what we've been doing on current transducers is we program them with a low range and a high range. And so I think the way John worded it here is what we were trying to capture. But I agree with you. I don't know that it's clear to somebody that uh, doesn't do smoke control every day. 
Yeah, and then the current switch too, you know, depending if the belt is on or, you know, there's other issues there as well. But anyway, the way it reads right now, it sounds like we need to have a flow switch and I, you know, we tried to do that 25 years ago, but it has, I've never seen it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I agree. That's old technology not used anymore. Could you just put, can it be solved by saying uh, if provided? I don't know how you can prove that the fan is moving air. Uh, I mean, um, mechanically speaking, unless you put the pitot too. So it's basically through the CT, but it doesn't quite read that way. And, and I know it's an existing um, language. So yeah, I don't know if anybody has the smoke control handbook handy. But there's probably probably better language in the handbook. To I think it's about the same. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I no, I think this is this is a part of our lore that I think is probably acceptable. You're right; it is just a handful of people that do the small control, but we all pretty much know what that means. That's right. So I just wanted to mention that that nobody ever does that. There's no way to prove it unless you put a pitot too. And we're doing it with the current suites, but I think some of that stuff was written a very long time ago and it's still there. I don't have a problem with it being there, Michael. I think it's the concept that air needs to be flowing, not just a fan is turned on. So no, I agree. I mean it's already there. I'm just going to bring it to you. Okay. That's all right. Just because something's in there doesn't mean it has to stay in there. It's not right. Um all right, so we have in front of us this just um, existing language brought over um, and just relocated into this location. Uh, any other discussion? Or motions? Tony making a motion to approve as submitted. Okay. Second. And who was that second, Wayne? Wayne. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Been moved and seconded for as submitted. Any other discussion? Just no. minor so the committee knows uh, when we're finalizing this document, I'll change the alphabetical number into the standard uh, numerical number. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right. I will call the question. All those in favor of this proposal as submitted, please raise your hand. Looks like 10. All those opposed? One opposed. And did we end up with more votes now? How did we do that? One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine. I don't think so. I think that was a mistake. We only have 10 voting members. Yeah, okay. All right. As well as just um, ask one more time, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, eight. Now we have eight. All those opposed. All those abstaining. I wonder if people are having trouble voting. Okay. Well, it's pretty unanimous with a vote of um, as submitted passes eight to zero to one. Um, so let me lower all those hands. Okay. No modifications, so I can close that one out. The next proposal up is number 23. Sorry, I had them all pulled up until we lost. All right. Let me just get this a little bit bigger so that we can maybe see it. I don't know. All right. This proposal is uh, John, so I'm imagining, Tony, that you're going to present this proposal? Yep, that's correct. <clears throat> so this uh, section 916.9 is signage for gas detection systems. And John has some 
fairly minor modifications in its uh, coordination of language primarily for the signage. All right, anybody from the public wishing to speak on this item? Anybody from the public? Seeing none, committee? Can you see it? Anything else? I'll take discussion or a motion or pretty much one of those. It's Tony making a motion to approve okay. as committed. All right. Thank you, Tony. Is there a second? Brad, was that you? Or Wayne? Wayne? Wayne. Sorry. You guys sound a little alike. All right. It's been moved and seconded for as submitted. Any discussion? Doesn't appear to be any discussion. I'll call the question. All those in favor of number 23 as submitted, please raise your hand. That looks like a vote of 10. All those opposed? One. All those abstaining? All right. I'm not sure how this is going, but 10 to 1 to 0. I'm sure, if there's a, just a delay there, is what I really think is happening. But hey, Sean, I'm noticing a delay on the voting stuff on my end. Uh, okay, I, I thought so. There's seems when, to be a... when you did abstain, everyone from, uh, from approval ha still had their hands up on my screen for some reason. Oh, oh, on my screen, they were all down. It's just that. I have 10 voting members, but I keep getting a 10 count on approval and then one over on disapproval. And so I'm not sure how that is happening. I'm guessing it's a delay of some sort. Blame it on Zoom. They've already canceled us once today. <laughs> there you go. It's a, it's a Zoom thing. If, 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 it's, if it's observation, Shana, uh, Chief, I've noticed that you, you vote for it, but your hand is still there. Uh, it comes up again for... Yeah. That's what I see. That's I think that's yeah. the one's coming from. Chief, Chief, I put up uh, you. You vote for it, and then I lower all the hands, and then your hand comes up again, in, in, again in opposition um, almost every time. So that's where I'm trying to figure out if there's what's going on there. But all right, let's call the floor number seventy-seven. Oops, I want the word version so we can. All right, Tony, this appears to be you with section 915 and a new 1103. Um, looks like you're moving stuff or something. Perfect. Right. So again, Tony with Denver Fire, um, this is carbon monoxide. And Denver, we originally wrote our own policy in 2009 when the Colorado State Legislator required carbon monoxide after a couple of uh, tragic incidents. And that language has existed in our amendments uh, since that time. But uh, two cycles ago, carbon monoxide came into the national code, the base IFC. So my intent is to migrate back to the base language. And the only thing we retain would be carbon monoxide in central fuel burning appliance locations like central uh, boiler rooms that serve the entire building we would retain that for new buildings and also in chapter 11 for existing buildings. Okay. So that's a topic that's not in the base IFC, but we've used in Denver since 2009. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. Is there anybody from the public wishing to speak on this item? I'm basically retaining these sections right here here for central fuel burning. Anybody wishing to speak? All right, committee? Questions, concerns, conversation, motion? Shauna, could you, would you scroll down to the, the date that's referenced, I think in red? There's a date referenced here. Yeah.
I think, Shauna, if you scroll down to section 11, the lower section, it would cover or retain that, I believe. Oh, right here. Okay. Yeah, that because that was the date where the state instituted that requirement, right? And that's why we're. Yeah, that's correct. That's and that's why we're retaining it yeah. okay. for the existing building portion. Right. Okay. Okay. Any other discussion? Or motion? Don't make Tony make all the motion. <laughs> Make a motion to accept as submitted. All right. Is there a second? Tony seconds it. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded for as submitted. Um, any other discussion? Seeing none, I will call the question. All those in favor of as submitted, please raise your hand. Okay. There's 10 of you. <laughs> I'm going to lower all those hands and ask if there's any opposition. No? And any abstain? No. Perfect. All right. So as submitted 10 to 0 for item number 77. We'll call now to the floor item number 24. Oops, that's not going to work. There you go. Number 24, Tony. I'm... Maybe this is you. Yep, okay, submitted by John Wojcic, Tony Denver Fire uh, speaking on behalf. And again, this is uh, gas detection systems. And um, John is clarifying in here that our fire alarm panels, when they exist, will enunciate an activated gas detection system. And it's a practice we've been using. It was in our code, but it wasn't very clear. So he's, he's brought it into the correct section. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody from the public wishing to speak on this item? Anybody from the public? I know I keep feeling it, it itches a bunch. Um, all right, committee. Hello? It seems pretty straightforward to me. I a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Okay. And um, that was Wayne and George. Yep. All right. Moved for um, as submitted. Any further discussion needed? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor of this item number 24 as submitted, please raise your hand. Um, I'm seeing nine. All those opposed? One, two, one. Okay. Sorry. That was, I it did it again on my end, Sean. I was okay. raising my hand for approval. Yeah, okay. I saw you for approval, and you're right, it did do that, but um, it, it went away again. So, all right. So, I show um, item number. 24 being approved as submitted with a vote of nine to one. Um, and Wayne, that one wasn't you. Okay. All right. So that is as submitted. I'm going to get rid of that one. And that one. I'm going to keep one of them up there because it was amended. All right. Item number 67. We're rolling right along, and I really appreciate you guys um, for doing that. Item number 67, Michael Stewart. Uh, proposal here. Is Michael available or somebody speaking for him? Is there anybody wishing to speak in uh, just as a, to give a summary for this proposal? Yeah, it's Tony with Denver Fire. Um, okay. Mike Stewart works for Denver Fire. Okay. He's supposed to be on here, but I'll speak on his behalf. Okay. I see him. He you is see? on you guys. It's Oh, there he yeah, is. Oh, the I just have to make time. him. All right, let me give him the allow him to talk here. There we go. Can you hear me now? Oh, there we can hear you now. Yeah. Oh, good. Right. I was just about to send Tony a text to say, no, I am here. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Sorry about that. 
So on uh, this particular proposal, um, in the past, we've had like two different documents. We had a cert to operate your elevator and an operational permit. Um, because of limitations in our new database, we're basically, we're going to combine both of those documents into one. So the first part of the language is just combining that part, saying the operational certificate of operation is, is basically one document. Um, current uh, amendments already require you to have both documents anyways. This is just showing that it's just going to be one document. It's being rolled into one. The second part on the last sentence, it says conveyance contractor shall not perform maintenance, replace components, conduct repair work, or perform testing on elevators, escalators, or AGTS do not have a current certificate of operation certificate of, or operational certificate of operation permit. We have issues uh, currently where elevator contractors are doing work on elevators that aren't being compliant. Um, part of their licensing with the state and us is if they know there's a, an elevator that's out of compliance, they're supposed to notify us, but they don't. This is, will help to make sure that we can kind of hold their feet to the fire to make sure that they're just sending us a quick email saying, hey, we know this, this elevator here, we're called to work on it. We know it's not current. Once they email, email us, it takes the burden off of them and puts it on us, and then we can try to get that uh, conveyance compliant. Um, currently, our our current policy, I forget which policy it is, um, already requires this. We just haven't, haven't enforced that part of the policy because it wasn't in our amendments. Okay, perfect. Um, is there anybody from the public wishing to speak on this? Anybody out there? All right, committee, you have questions uh, for Mike or any comments, discussion, motion? Come on. <laughs> I'll just say it, it seems pretty straightforward and, and it's consistent with what uh, they have to do for the database and for their um, their normal operation, their business practices. So I don't I don't see any objections. I don't have any objections. Is that a motion for us submitted, Brad? I move that we uh, <laughs> accept this as submitted. All right. Is there a second? I'll second that. Oh, who was that second? Russell. 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 It sounded like Russell, but I didn't see you. Okay, all right, well, it's been moved and seconded for as submitted. Any discussion? Not seeing none, I will call the question. All those in favor for proposal number 67 as submitted, please raise your hand. That looks like a vote of nine. All those opposed? All those abstaining? Hmm. All right, well, that proposal passes with a vote of nine to zero. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Michael. All right, we're gonna call to the floor item number 78. Oh, well, do you guys wanna take a quick break? Or you wanna hear one more or take a break? Take a break real quick. Well, up to you. We need to take a break because yeah, we can't let's take go. A break. all right. Let's take a break. Let's take let's take five. Will that work? Is five minutes good for everybody? Use the facilities. Fill your water bottles. All right. We'll come back at three forty one. Three forty one. I was trying to get my timer going, but make sure everybody's here. Five minutes is a very much time to do anything. So. <laughs> We were on a roll and I don't want to break up the momentum. All right. Well, we have to wait till Tony comes back. This is his proposal. I'm back. Okay, Tony. Hello. 
All right, this is your proposal number 78, it looks like. Yeah, and I'm going to use the, the famous words. It's another easy one. <laughs> Don't you. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> and so when we started our elevator program in uh, 2012 uh, and it spanned to 2014, the startup, we wanted hard line POTS lines for communication in the cabs. Well, as we all know, POT lines are going away. And this is an antiquated language. Um, so we're removing that to stay current with existing technology. Thank you. Anybody from the public wishing to speak? You just have to raise your hand and then I can give you permission to speak. So anybody from the public? Mike? I'll are you, are you there, maybe? There you yeah, go. so just in su support of this, um, with the new elevator technologies um, requiring cell cellular now for texting and uh, video capabilities is another reason we need to uh, drop that requirement. Gotcha. Perfect. Thank you so much. Anybody else? All right. Committee? Comment? Uh, George? I'd like to uh, have this accepted as, as uh, submitted. Okay. Is there a second? I, I do have a question and I'll say or. Okay, I, I just need a second on that motion real quick. I'll second. Okay, Michael. All right, Michael, what is your question? So that means that we don't need to have a, a phone line anymore, is that? Am I reading it correctly? Yeah, no, no, it just means that you're not using POTS lines as a technology to provide the service. Okay. So like Mike said, a lot are using cellular or um, even VoIP in some cases. Okay. Just doesn't have to be a loop start feasible phone line. But maybe are you just wondering if it should stay still say you need phone line, just not that kind of phone line? Yeah, like a landline. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. All right, George. It says right in the very start, two-way and car communication shall be provided, and I, I think that basically alludes to any technology that will be approved. All right. Any other discussion? All right, seeing none, um, I don't see anybody from the public or anybody else wishing to speak. I am going to call the question. The motion on the floor is for number 78 as submitted. All those in, oh, Russell, did you, oh, yeah, everybody's voting. All right, all those in favor of as submitted. <laughs> All right, that's a vote of 10. All those opposed? And anybody abstaining? No. All right, I didn't think so. Okay, so number 78 has uh, passed as submitted a vote to 10 to zero. Falling to the floor, item number 62, which looks like it's Michael Stewart. So let me go over here and Michael give you uh, permission to speak. All right. Okay, so Mike Stewart with Denver Fire. Um, this one is just adding on to an existing requirement that we already have for new construction to put the disconnect location. Um, it's been very difficult for um, uh, fire crews on elevator entrapments to find these rooms. Um, the first portion is also including in accordance with uh, 907-6411. Um, the, the biggest change on it would be a 920.231 uh, that would make this retroactive to all buildings with elevators that they would need to provide this. Uh, one thing that we've seen, you know, some pretty good luck with some of the new um, installs or even some of the alterations, but we're still getting complaints from the fire crews on ex existing buildings where they're not doing anything with the elevators. They're still having uh, difficulties finding these rooms, especially when it comes to the MRL, the machine roomless uh, elevator technology. Um, so that's why we're trying to make this retroactive to uh, make sure all buildings comply with it. 
Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Anybody else from the public wishing to speak? All right, committee. Tony with Denver Fire <clears throat> supporting the proposed amendment. And uh, really, this is so what we're identifying is the disconnect locations for the elevator uh, control centers. And all it involves is a graphic map to show fire crews where those disconnects are located. It's been a requirement since I believe 2011, um, but we were putting the onus on fire alarm contractors to show it on their graphic maps. And really this puts the onus on the elevator contractors who know the information uh, to create the map, frame it and post it in the fire command center or adjacent to the fire alarm panel. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, I'll, um, one comment on it is, <clears throat> is the elevator contractor will have to ask the electrician for that location because that's what we have to ask for now to label the disconnects on our um, elevators themselves. So um, maybe it ought to be both the elevator contractor and the electricians on the job. And for the record, that was Russell. Oh. All right. Any other discussion? Hey, hey, Russell, this is Tony with Denver Fire. I agree with you, except that the installation permit is specifically issued to the elevator contractor. Yeah, um, the problem is they're not going to know um, at the time of permit whether they're going to have that power fed from. Um, yeah, on the MRLs, the problem is <clears throat> sometimes they're anywhere in the building. And actually on my inspections of on acceptance, I'm usually chasing down the, the um, electricians to get them to give me a location of where they're feeding the power from. You know, I, I know our electrical group with building department definitely looks at those during the issuance of the electrical permit and that's during the log submittal. So you're correct, it would be before the elevator contractor submits their submittal. But I guess typically they coordinate amongst themselves to get this accomplished. Yeah, that's why I'm saying to do a graphic map at the time of permitting, that'd be pretty tough for electrical or the elevator contractor because I'll tell you right now, they're gonna have no idea where it's coming from. But but they should because the log electrical plans have been approved by the time they touch it. So it's just a matter of them looking at the electrical approved drawings and figuring that out. Which I know most of them don't want to do. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I bet that their project managers don't even look at those logs. Are you yeah, wanting hey, a modification mean. maybe that says the licensed electrician and or elevator contractor? That's, yeah. kind of a, that's kind of a problem for me. You need to have one person responsible for okay. it. Speaking from somebody that has to go and talk to, you know, 18 different trades to get everything on the fire alarm graphic map, we understand the pain but there still needs to be one person responsible for it. In this case, it's an elevator map. So I, I mean, and Russell, I'm just saying who's gonna be responsible. Yeah, hey Mike, um, do you, how much, how much faith do you have the elevator contract to be able to find this information beforehand? We're all teachable, every one of us. Well, we, I mean, we usually on the, on our side, on the electrical side, we get the elevator information very late, like during the submit. Um, I mean, the project is well under construction. I guess the other important part to point out is this is retroactive. So existing buildings would have to rely on the elevator contractor that's providing the servicing to create this map. Right, and if I can, I mean, the, the uh... 
we're not going to require this information at time of elevator permitting. This wouldn't have to be done until the end of the job. It's something that uh, Lieutenant Johnson's group, when they're doing their fire alarm testing with the elevators or other portions of the building, that's when they're looking for this information. So it wouldn't have to be uh, brought to to uh, the conveyance section uh, prior to that. It only has to make sure that it's done when the uh, um, inspectors are on site and they're verifying the locations. So even on the conveyance staff, this doesn't even add any work for us. This is something that the elevator contractor has to do and make sure it's done once they start uh, going for approvals. Um, and even on existing equipment, I agree with Tony, um, and as you know, Russ, elevator contractors and the mechanics, they have to know where these, these main lines are for when they're working on the elevators. They have to have the ability to shut off power. So you yeah. know, they have that information. And again, we won't need it up front anyways. Yeah, I think on the existing, uh, existing equipment, it's an easy one <clears throat> because it's already labeled on all of their disconnects where that's at. So that's that's the easy part. Um, oh, but on the MRLs, if you have the fire crews, we have to have a key to actually access that. So you're right; it should be in the fire command center so they can get to the disconnected speeding, the disconnect to the MRL. Right, or located next to the fire alarm control panel when it's not when you don't have the FCC. Yeah. Um, yeah, right now it's it's labeled on the disconnect that, that speed is. Yeah, um, I, I, you know, we give it a run, but I just, um, there's going to be a delay on the elevator contractor's part because, man, he's going to be hit pretty hard with that, and then he's got to make a plastic, trans, a transparent plastic surface with the location on there. But they better get their own shit, or excuse me, they have their own stuff going, let alone adding this to it, but hell, yeah, we can give it a run. Well, even on the new installs, I have not heard this being an issue of holding up any jobs from the uh, the fire inspectors. Nobody's told me that this is an issue at the end of a job. Nobody's really, uh, I don't know that they have a, a panel that shows that. Well, the fire inspectors tell me they're looking for it and it's been working well. I, 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 had, I can only go with the information they've given me. Yeah, let's give it a run. All right. Is that a motion for approval? Tony with Denver Fire motioning for approval as submitted. All right. Thank you, Tony. Second by. I'll second it. All right. Thank you, George. All right, it's been moved and seconded for as submitted. Uh, any further discussion from the public? Let me look over here. Somebody has their hand up. Oh, that's this mic still. Okay, um, I'm going to lower your hand, Mike, so that I can. All right, all those in favor of as submitted for item number, this is 62. Raise your hand. All right, that looks like a vote of nine. All right, all those opposed? All those abstaining? Okay, well, item number 62 passes with a vote of nine to zero. That brings us to item number 50. Maybe I can open it. Well, try to open it. All right, there we go. And this is also Mike again, so I probably need to go back over here and give him write permissions. Okay, so on this one here, all of the companies right now, uh, major companies except for Kone, are using the uh, the black belts. Um, one company, TK, they only manufacture the fire rated belts. Both Otis and Schindler, they manufacture the non-rated belts, but they're trying to do everything they can not to, to sell to sell those because of some of the other issues that come along. Talking to all the companies, you know, the major companies, they do not oppose 
um, this for, you know, requiring of the fire rated belts because that's what they're trying to sell um, anyways. Where this can really come in handy um, is for city plan reviewers and, and the fire engineers. I get questions all the time of, of when buildings are being reviewed of, hey, what type of elevator is going in? Because we're, we're looking at that we need to require sprinklers top and bottom of the shafts. Um, and I don't know that information at the time. Typically, I don't get elevator information for a year or so after you guys have, uh, or they've already done their reviews. So having this requirement can actually help other city employees during their reviews um, to know that, hey, they have to be fire rated belts. So if the elevator shaft meets the other conditions within an NFPA codes, then they don't necessarily have to, to sprinkler those. And they definitely wouldn't have to sprinkler the bottom of the pits because these are all on traction elevators. So that's where I think this would be a, a good place to, to go is to requiring the uh, fire rated belts. On alterations, it can be an issue. Uh, there hasn't been any lately, but there's going to be more in the future since this is the the wave, you know, the future of these uh, 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 belts. There has been in the past with Schindler installing some of these on alterations and replacing the hoist machines, and they they weren't installing the fire rated belts, but the sprinkler wasn't, uh, or excuse me, the shafts weren't sprinkled. And that becomes an issue that if they're not doing that and you don't have an unsprinkler shaft, now you're going to have to require the building owner to sprinkler the shaft as well. This also eliminates that issue if it comes up again. May I ask for some clarification? Um, the way that I'm reading this, the elevator has to be rated and not the belt. Is, would you, uh, it seems like it should say those belts used in new elevators need to be fire rated because right now it just says elevators that use those kind of belts need to be fire rated. And so I believe that the wording is just a little mixed up, but I could be totally wrong. And I would like to be able to discuss that because it says new elevator installations using those belts have to be fire rated. That well, it says so. well, I guess utilizing non-circular, you know, using the belts. I believe that utilizing is the same language as that's an NFPA 13. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I just think it needs to say that belts, those belts used in new elevator installations need to be rated because right now, and, and I could be wrong, I'm just pointing this out, the way it's worded to me, it looks like the elevator has to be rated and not the belt in both sentences, the first sentence and the second sentence. So I just want to bring that up. Um, maybe uh, Glenn or somebody else could look at the wording and-, and... So Shauna, would we just add belt after fire rated? It, to me, I mean, we can leave that up to Glenn, but it just seems like um, non-circular elastomeric coated and polyurethane coated steel belt utilized in new elevator installations and alterations shall be fire rated, right? So that it's right. the belt that has to be fire rated and not the elevator, but that's Glenn. Yeah, you're correct, Shauna. The, the, the subject for fire rating is the elevator, the way this is written. It does need a little massaging. That's something I, looks like I missed. That's okay. All right. Um, Thank you, Mike, for the clarification that is truly the belt. Let's go to anybody from the public wishing to speak on this. Anybody from the public and committee? Right. This Tony from, not... Dem Tony oh, from Denver ahead. Fire, I'd like to support the proposal. And one of the things um, we're doing in Denver is uh, in the latest, or in 2019, the code changed and fire alarm technicians can no longer access the hoistway to test fire alarm equipment. So that's become a big problem. So in Denver, we're doing everything we can to try to eliminate having fire alarm equipment so that it doesn't have to be tested from outside the hoistway. And it's been a big challenge and it's a big cost uh, impact to owners not just for initial install, but long-term IT and M. Um, so I think this proposal helps meet that goal and eliminates some of those devices in some cases. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Anybody else? 
Yeah, I'm I'm in support of this as well, but I just want to clarify that this proposal would not exclude any elevator suppliers from working in Denver. Can anyone confirm that? I, I can. Right now, again, there's only uh, three manufacturers that are using these belts. I don't know of any independent companies that are using the belts at all. Uh, but again, you know, the, the three major manufacturers that are using the belts, they don't, um, um, they have no problem with this because again, one only manufactures fire rated belts and the other two are trying to move that direction internally, but they haven't yet. And it helps them on, on, on their side even just to make sure they're um, installing the proper belts. Um, I don't know of any independent companies that even utilize belt technology at all. Okay, thanks. Has there no, been any I'm consideration sorry. as to how I'm going to go to Wayne, please. Can we talk to Wayne? Sorry. Um, no. has, there, has there been any consideration given to a, a similar code section or similar reference in the IBC Chapter 30? Or I, I know in previous conversations, we've tried to, whenever possible, um, as it relates to Chapter 9 things, try to not or make it as, easier, as, as easy as possible on the design teams to find compliance items. Has this, has a similar been, proposal been provided for the IBC side of things? Not that I can recall as the, sitting in on those, but um, one thing that I will note that we had to do yesterday uh, for a different hearing is if we identify something in another code, um, since the year, since Denver is going to keep hearing these after our committees are over, if we identify a conflict or something that you guys want to change in another code, we can't change it in another code. But if we identify something that needs to change in another code, we can um, make those recommendations to them and they will make sure there's no conflicts. Sure. I don't know that there's something, anything specific in Chapter 30 from a conveyance uh, combust combustion standpoint. Um, I just thought it, it might make some sense to have it in both both places and have them coordinated. Um, having said all that, I'm in general support of this. I think it's a little bit of a reach to um, require non-combustible suspension, but in the fire life safety uh, context of things, I think it's the right thing to do, but can't really speak to an ownership standpoint to see what that cost is and how they you know weigh that decision ultimately on any given project. Anybody else? Well, we don't have a motion on the floor, so take a motion. Um, I, I make the motion we accept as written. Liz Ross. Okay. Tony seconds that motion. If we're as submitted without modifying it to I wanted to offer you guys just some clerical language to address the subject of the fire rating. Doesn't change the intent. Uh, you may want to consider something like where new elevator installations and alterations utilize non-circular elastomeric coated or polyurethane coated steel belts, such belts shall be fire rated. Where existing elevators utilize coated steel belts at the time of suspension means or controller replacement, the new equipment shall be installed with the fire rated type. That would point the ratings back to the replaced items or the new the belts in the new edition. Comma, comma, yeah, such belts shall be fire rated. I think that would address the uh, the issue that, that Sean mm -hmm. correctly identified. And then what did you say here? I was suggesting something like the same, starting out the same, where existing elevators utilize coated steel belts. At the time, suspension means or controller replacement at the time of, um, you can say such equipment shall be installed unless you have a better term than equipment for those two items. Um, I think that's changing the intent 
of the language. Right. Well, I believe you're not trying to fire rate the elevators. You're trying to fire rate the replaced okay. items, correct? Well, yeah, but but you're giving them a choice. You're saying where you install um, elevators utilizing these belts, such belts shall be fire rated. I guess what I would where where you want to install but you want to require them to install those belts. Gotcha. Well, if they utilize those, right? No, where, period. Just period. Saying, where new elevators utilize those belts, the belts have to be fire rated. It doesn't give you the opportunity to put the elevator in. It's just saying if you utilize the belts, they have to be fire rated. We could word it. We could do it. We could switch it like we had talked about earlier, just saying start the sentence with Yes. Where non-circular or whatever, where non-circular elastic metric blah, 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 belts are used in the new elevator, in, in new elevator installations and alterations, such belts shall be fire rated. It right, would don't say just, the same thing. I was just trying to be as gentle yeah. as possible. Yeah, yeah. Just, I, would, I would not use the word where, because that implies a choice. Yeah. Well, the choice is to Well, the choice, the you have a That's choice. You do have a choice on whether or not you use that non-circular elastic metric coded. I, I don't think that's the intent. I think the might correct me, but I think the intent is to require uh, the fire rated belts. Yeah. Period. That is I thought there were aren't there other systems that don't utilize the belts? Is what, I'm not an elevator expert, but that's what. Yes, there are other uh, elevator systems that utilize traditional metal cables, but they don't need to be mentioned here because, again, you have to be fire rated to the FT1 rating. That yeah. FT1 rating is only for the non-circular elastomeric coated and polyurethane coated belts. Um, a traditional metal cable is already fire rated and it couldn't meet that FT1 rating anyways because it, it yeah. has nothing to do with it. That's so, Shauna, the, Shauna, the way you had rearranged the sentence in the in the disc open discussion, I think nails it. So, I, I would I would vote for that. Yep. Either way is fine with me. I was just trying to rewrite as little as possible. Understood. Uh, like that, non circular elastomeric coated or polyurethane coated steel belts used in new elevator installations and alterations shall be fire rated. Or I think that isn't that perfect. And then the same with, and then I guess it existing elevators using, and then have to redo the second one. And so right. Co um, coated steel belts. Right. Coated steel belt. Mm -hmm. Hmm. On existing in or in or on existing elevators shall be installed with the fire rated type at the time of suspension means or controller replacement. Oh, so is the of the fire as shall be installed with the fire rated type at time of suspension means or controller replacement. And then the rest of this space. So we would just go like take all of this out. Sorry. Sorry. And leave that. And replace it with this. Coated steel belts utilizing existing elevators shall be installed with the fire rated type at time of suspension means or controller replacement. Well, it shall be the, in fire rated type. Coated steel belts utilized in existing elevators shall be the, the fire rated type. Shall be the fire rated type. Hmm. Coated steel belts utilizing existing elevators shall be replaced. With. Mike, how does that read to you? I think it reads fine looking at it. 
And I like the second sentence that talks about, because I know there are a couple of installations uh, that use the non-rated belts. And now this is telling them when they have to be replaced, they have to be replaced with fire rated belts. Okay, well, right now the motion on the floor is for as submitted. This was a friendly modification that would need somebody to move if we so want the modification. <laughs> Can I amend my original motion, Shauna? To um, sure, as modified. Approve as modified. Sure. It's um uh George, who was uh Brad will amend his second. Or, second, no, yeah, second. Russell or whoever it was. Uh, it, was it was actually Russell. It was Russell seconded earlier. Mm -hmm. No, it was George. Oh, was it? Okay. I don't yes. know. <laughs> All I'll, right. I'll, I'll second Tony's. Okay. All right, you got like five seconds. So I'll, third it. I'll third it. Okay. All right. All right. So um, I will say um, right now we have a motion on the floor for as modified by what you see on the screen. Actually, not really. This would be the first sentence replacing what's struck through, and the last sentence would stay remaining. Um, is there any discussion? Anybody from the public wishing to speak to this modification? No? Okay. Committee, uh, if there's no other discussion, I will call the question. All those in favor of Item number, what is this, 50? <laughs> Item number 50 as modified. Please raise your hand. And that looks like a vote of nine. All those opposed? All those abstaining? I think we're just down to nine. Uh, so that as modified passes nine to zero. Thank you very much for um, allowing me to have input. <laughs> Sorry. We already skipped on the agenda. We already handled number 46. So we're going to go to item number 49 now. So item number 49 is Tony. So Tony, you want to go ahead? OK, uh, basically, uh, famous words, another easy one. And uh, we're adding the exception here. Uh, there's many one and two family dwellings that are installing generators, standby generators. And our code uh, unintended consequence was requiring them to have some sort of enunciator to let responding crews know. And uh, that was never really the intent of this section. So we exempt them from having the remote enunciator. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Anybody from the public wishing to speak on this item number 49? Anybody? No? Oh, all right. Committee? Fred? Uh, um, just a quick, quick question, Tony. Are you, are you wanting to only exempt the IRC, one and two family dwellings and townhouses, or you want to exempt R4s under the IBC as well. R3s that's, and R4s. Yeah, that's that's a great question, Brad. Um, but I think mostly what we've seen coming in are IRC types. You, and that's I mean, usually homeowners that want some sort of backup or reliability. But so, but does Denver Fire want the panels on R3s and R4s? Anything under the IBC? So you're trying to say it should say one and two family dwellings, townhouses, R3s, and R4s. So that it includes everything under the IRC and the R3 and R4s? Well, I think if you just leave it as is, it'll include everything that's either permitted under the IRC or the IBC, but if you're looking to only exclude the IRC um, single family dwellings and townhouses, one and two family dwellings and townhouses, then I would suggest that we say that we- 
constructed under, constructed yeah, permitted under, under the IRS. IRS under the International yeah. Residential Code or something that effect. And you, and you bring up a, maybe a bigger point and maybe Mike Pasas can answer, but generally um, for these small locations, any transfer switch uh, or disconnect means is at the, the only disconnect means to the building. So it's apparent to fire crews, you know, that there's a, a generator there providing alternate power. Uh, it's not in, like in a commercial building where we're concerned that maybe firefighters don't know that there's alternate power and the transfer switch is remote. Um, but I think in, in these situations, it's clearly apparent to the responding crews. And so that's why we don't need it. Yeah, so Tony, I kind of had the question. <laughs> uh, so if I buy a generator from Costco and I want to install it at my house, uh, how does that work? Do I need to submit drawings and the defer submittal of some sort or? Yeah, yeah. right now the only thing that gets permitted is through the building department electrical group mm -hmm. and then fire department, if they're diesel, um, fire department typically looks at the fueling and refueling. But if they're natural gas, we typically do not review them. And that's for any size, even the ones from Costco per se? That's correct. That's how Shana, the current code's written. Sean, can you pull up the base um, IFC section related to this? Oh, yeah. Let me, what, what section was that? 1203.1. Okay. And it actually may be in the amendments, Shauna. Okay, we'll have those here too. Well, let's look in the base here. 1203. So my comment would be looking at 1203.1, and there, there is, I don't think there is an amendment to that. There's an add-on at the end. But all that's saying is if the, the building, if, if a generator is required by the code, you'd have to comply with this. So if a homeowner is just purchasing a um, generator, none of that section would apply unless because it's not required by the code. It's an option. That's the way I will have interpreted as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah except that, um, Robert, um, 105.6 would require you to have an operational permit for the fueling aspect. I mean, you can you can still pull a permit for, for the operation and install without having to comply with um, the amendment, I guess, because it's, it's a non-required item. So there is... 12031 is modified in the amendments, but not 1203.1. So, so basically all of these requirements only apply to those things required by the IBC. So that would mean that your new exception, and correct me if I'm wrong, Glenn, I'm probably inserting where I shouldn't be, uh, that this is only exempting out one or two family dwellings built under the IBC because that's the only thing that it applies to right now. It's the only potential place where it would be required. Hmm. So Tony, as far as the fueling, I mean, they have to do a remote fuel of some sort or? No, no I think, but um, Michael, the part we're exempting is just having a remote status. Oh, I saw panel. that. It's just that it kind of triggers my attention. <laughs> I cannot buy a generator from Costco. <laughs> Yeah, no, those would just be fueled in place, typically. Yeah. But according to this section, you can. Mm -hmm. You could buy the Costco generator because it's not required. You have to get an operational permit, but you don't have to comply with anything else in this chapter, in that section, anyway. I see. Right, because it's not required by the IBC. Hmm. I think if you wanted it to apply, you would need to go in and change 
make an amendment here to say something different in 1201, but currently Denver doesn't have any amendments to 1201-1, starts at 1.1. Yeah, so so maybe is is the committee thinking maybe we don't need yeah, we it, don't need the amendment and and we, maybe we just modify it to say all required generators instead of just leaving all generators. Yeah, all required. Yeah, you, <laughs> that sounds much better. I I, I agree with that too. Yeah, that works. I was going to return the generator I got from Costco. <laughs> <laughs> and you're saying you don't, so then you don't even need this exception? Um, right. In your section 102.5 uh, in chapter one of IFC and your amendments for applicability, this is application of residential code, uh, item A, is interior or exterior renovations. And then if you look at the base code on that, other than premise identification, interior and exterior systems or devices are installed. Just seeing how that plays in, because you have, again, 102.5 that is supposed to lay out the applicability of the IFC to IRC building. Just making sure that you're meshing with that well. Yeah. Yeah, which I, I guess you're right, Glenn. That would that would work in conjunction with 105.6.66 on the annual operational permits. Shoot, I was hoping I could buy Michael's uh, generator to discount. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I live in laundry, so I'm safe. <laughs> I think. 105.6.66. which really I'm thinking that should probably be modified because I don't know that the fire department wants to be issuing. Oh, sorry, those sections change. Yeah, right there. Right here, okay. A, a permit is required to maintain and operate the following fuel generator without, with or without paint. So what? whether you're diesel or natural gas, we're, we're issuing permits, but I don't know that such are required for single family residences. Uh, well, I don't know that the electrocution hazard is there, which is what we're concerned with, or the fueling hazard either. I think that goes back to the section that Glenn was pointing at. Other than premise identification, 105 shall not apply. <coughs> to interior or exterior renovations, petitions, demolition or removal. Hmm. So is it your thought, Glenn, that even though this section in the IBC says Emergency power systems and standby systems required by this code have to comply with that required by the, or required by the IBC have to comply. That's, um, and so now we don't have to worry about talking about single family dwellings because they're not required by the IBC to have emergency power and standby systems. Mm -hmm. That's what they're trying to say right here. So they revamped their proposal to say, if a generator is required, then it has to do this 
we don't even need this exception because those are not required to have generators. Are you thinking that in somewhere in 102 that we've created a conflict because maybe the IFC applies differently uh, to Denver than it does? I, I don't think anything is needed at all because 120313 is already a subsection saying that yeah. where these apply where this is required. Um, hmm. But I mean, since you're amending it for further clarification, I guess it doesn't hurt to add one word in there. I think I think Shauna, if you go back to the the base amendments, I think the original committee's intent was that they did apply. So if you look at, oh, I'm sorry, the the proposal proposal language. Yeah, look look at the second sentence in that. Optional standby generators shall be provided with a remote standard. So standard. those are generators that are not required by the code. Mm -hmm. And because the intent was to try to protect firefighting crews from getting electrocuted, if they if they shut the main building power and weren't aware that there's a generator providing power, they may not shut it off before trying to do work. So that was the intent of the committee was to try to prevent electrocution hazards. Right. So whether or not you say required here, it's all generators. And this second sentence is reiterating that even the optional ones Correct. will have to comply. You can say, you can leave your thing in here or not. Right now, this is saying generator serving one and two family dwellings and townhouses. That would, if you leave it in there, that means any generator serving one and two family dwellings and townhouses built under the IBC only, because it only applies to the IBC and only if the IBC had required them to have standby power, because 1201 says that. So really, that maybe you don't need any of this. If you if you disapprove the entire thing, you have all the generators, including the op, the standby optional generators, that have to be have to have that. But then, when you look at the base building code, it only applies to those that are required for the IBC, which wouldn't include your single family dwelling. Yeah, so really maybe maybe 1203.1 also needs to be amended to remove required by this code. Well, I, I think if your intent here is to not require a homeowner that buys a generator at Costco to put in a remote status panel, uh, seeing that optional language in the amendment I think you leave the exception as is and get the required out of there. Assuming that is your intent here, Tony, that you don't want a remote SAS panel on every owner yeah, option generator. That is correct. It, uh, I mean, it's not perfect and it leaves a little bit to be interpreted, I guess, but it's probably better than having everyone have to buy a, a status panel. Correct, which has been been a big problem. So, Robert, are you thinking on the on the base code we would also modify that? We'd remove the required by this code or the international building code. I, I don't re, I don't even know where to start because this the optional language there conflicts with the base code language. So, it's like the whole the whole thing kind of needs to start over almost. Yeah, in your current amendments, you have a you have an added subsection 1203.1.1.1 titled optional standby generators. So you even, you've got another place as well. So I think the point being made is probably good that that very first general statement is already conflicting with the existing um, amendment package. I and have maybe, an idea. 
simply strike the word by this code or the international building code. Yeah, that's a that's a quick fix. So twelve oh three dot one just says they must comply with these sections. Then that picks up your your other sections that are related to optional. Shauna, does that make sense? It it does make sense. I just uh, I'm concerned that we're you know we have a few different places that we're trying to um, make sure that we cover everything, and I just want to remind you guys that we already have two other proposals that are going to go to Denver and whatever committee that they have, and so if we have to table this one or or put a working group together to figure this out and make sure we've covered all bases, I would, you know, say we could do that. It just wouldn't be heard in front of this committee. It'd be heard in front of whatever committee that they, they make. Um, so Sorry. you have that option if you, if you <clears throat> think that this won't handle it all right now, Brad. So do you want to, I mean, would it be appropriate to take a vote? I mean, I think we all agree with the intent of what Tony is trying to, fire is trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, I think we understand the issues. Yes. That was a good catch, uh, catching that it's the, re the word required. And so I, um, knowing what the intent is, knowing that we all support it, I think, can we make up, yep. is it appropriate to make a motion yep. to, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to put this you off? Could, to, okay. You, you could, um, what we've done in the past, and we've done this with one other fire proposal, is everybody knows what the intent is, and you agree to have maybe Tony and Glenn and myself or somebody, you know, we, we put together a small working group that comes up with the language and it doesn't have to come back in front of the committee. It's approved as modified and then they write the modification based on the intent. Right. So if, if you, you for some reason you can't agree on its intent or if you can't agree on it, then it would have to go to another back to the working group. But we have uh, done that in the past. Uh, for me, I think the only thing that's not certain in terms of intent, at least I haven't gotten that feel yet, is are you trying to also exclude your IBC R3 and R4s? Or are you only trying to exclude the IRC structures? Uh, I think, Glenn, the intent is for both because the, the hazard's not there. Okay, so knowing that, then can the do you think the committee or the subcommittee could deal with it? Yeah, so it's basically going to involve amending this section, right, in the code, and then further modifying the the um, exception here to make sure it includes everything that fire wants it to include. Okay. I think the way it reads now, it covers both IRC and IBC. Yeah, it's the word required up front that's causing the conflict. And yeah, I'm nervous that there might be some other section in the code yep. uh, in this section, subsection in this section that uses the word, you know, optional right. or non-required or there something. Right. There the is. intent is that single families and townhouses do not have to comply with this requirement and that it applies to all generators, even the optional ones, other than single family and townhouses. Right. Both IBC and IRC single Correct. family and townhouses. Okay. All right. So that's the intent um, that we need to get on paper. So if you want to make a motion for as modified with the modification that meets the intent as discussed. So moved. Okay, thank you, <laughs> Brad. So uh, as modified, is there a I'll second? second that. Okay, thank you. And all right. And I guess before we take a vote, I want the committee to be comfortable with who's going to help write this. So that would be... Tony, Glenn, myself, and anybody else want to be involved on that? Okay, we will, we promise to meet the intent as you guys have discussed here. Good observation, Robert. Yes, very good. Thank you very much. 
All right, the motion on the floor is for as modified um, by this subgroup to meet the intent of today's conversation. All those in favor of that modification, please raise your hand. Nine and oppose. Oh, let me lower your hand. Opposed? Abstaining? All right, that passes nine to zero. We have 25 minutes left and I'm not allowed to let you go one minute after five. So I want to make sure that we are um, moving forward. Uh, do you guys think that you can handle another proposal? Uh, item number 48 is next on the agenda. Let's look at it. Well, we'll just start it. <laughs> I'll tell you what, we'll start it. If we get to, you know, five minutes till, we'll table it. All right. Um, that brings Brian. Brian Lucas is the proponent. Brian, I've just made you as an allowed to speak. So go Thank ahead. Thank you. Can you hear ready. me? Yes. Thanks. So this is an easy one in the infamous words of Tony as per the last one. Um, this is just a quick change to the gas detection requirements for uh, marijuana facilities, changing LPG gas detection that's in the room from 20 to 25%. Um, that aligns with other gas detection requirements in the fire code for other flammable gases. And we've had issues with 20% and manufacturers being able to um, meet that requirement. So it's changed to what is common for gas detection in the fire code. Thank you, Brian. Anybody else from the public wishing to speak? No? Brad? Oh, Brian, just real quick, do you, any memory of why 20% was originally set? I can't remember. Um, I know 10% was a lot, um, was debated a lot because 10%, I believe, is what first responders use. Um, but they're they're using it in a different fashion than what gas detection is typically for fixed. So um, I don't know where the 20% came from. It might've been just pulled from the air. Hmm. Okay. Motion to approve as written. Okay, Wayne, was a, a, as submitted, is there a second? A second. Hey, Robert. There's a motion for approval as submitted. For item number 48, is there further discussion? Let me see who has their hand up. Oh, okay. okay. All right, I see I'm not hearing any other discussion. So um, I'm gonna call the question for item number 48 for as submitted. All those in favor? Nine, opposed? Abstaining. I think we just totally lost chief, so I think that that's why there's only nine. All right, as submitted passes uh, nine to zero. The last item, unless we get through it too and can go start on 46 and 42, uh, is item number 53. Item 53, also Brian. Brian, you want to start this proposal? So this is a clarification for growing cannabis. Um, at heights above 12 feet. It's not clear currently how to deal with um, growing cannabis and racks that go above 12 feet. So the intent of this is to meet the requirements for high pile storage, um, specifically with exterior access doors, um, dead end aisles and, and, other, and other requirements. Um, the high pile storage chapter is designed around dealing with a fire at, at a height um, above 12 feet. Um, and the intent of this is to have cannabis comply with those same requirements for high pile storage. Thank you. Anybody from the public wishing to discuss this one? No, committee? Brian and Denver Fire, does, do you guys have any facilities currently that would have this situation? And if so, how have you addressed it? Um, we have enforced this by um, 
is basically working with the applicants and we do our highest grow is over 30 feet in Denver. Um, so yes, it is, it, it does occur, it does happen. Um, and vertical growing is where the future is at because warehouse space is what's been taken over to grow and um, 20, 30 foot ceilings are common. So if you can grow in racks, that's the most cost-effective way to do it when you don't have floor area. Okay, thank you. Hey, and I think brought Tony with Denver Fire, I think it's also important to point out how the level of fuel loading that these locations have um, with all the trays and, and, and irrigation components. And so it's important to treat them as, as a higher hazard like chapter 32 does. Thank you. Thank you. So just to clarify, you're not alluding to a specific commodity classification. You're not explicitly saying group A or class four or whatever. You're just saying to, to you're referring it back to chapter 32 to be classified based on the actual orientation and what they're using from a rack and shelf per, uh, perspective, I'm assuming. That's correct. How it gets protected. Um, yeah, if you're if you're referring to a, to a sprinkler design and how to how to get your commodity classification, yeah, we're leaving that open um, and is unclear um, and could be based on how much plastic trays you use. Um, but yeah, that's um, not intended to be included in this amendment. We just want to get with the access fire department access requirements um, and other requirements that would come out of Chapter Thirty Two. Fair enough. Thanks, Brian. All right, anybody else? Or a motion? Motion to approve as written. Hey, Wayne, thank you. Second. Thank you, George. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor of as submitted for item number 53, please raise your hand. And that is a nine. All those opposed, all those abstaining. All right. Um, that brings us to the end of the agenda. Uh, other than we forwarded item, uh, we tabled item number 46 and 42 to the end of the agenda. We have 15 minutes. I'm not 100% sure we can get through them, but do you want to start <laughs> one of them, one or the other? Whichever so one Shana, just is the most important. Just a point of order, aren't there some appendix chapter amendments? That was all that was on the published agenda, so I'm not allowed to add anything else because it wasn't published. There are some other amendments that got added late, I think, but those have to go straight to Denver because, or to the Denver Working Group. Because okay, that's what I was going to suggest. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah, unfortunately, sorry, because it wasn't on the published agenda. I can't bring it up. No, it's so the, okay. Only things available to us right now are 46 and 42. So um, we can start one of them. One, if one is easier than the other, um, I don't know. We've, we've suggested heard... 42 since you have just one document and one proposal option. Right. 42 has been heard once and sent to a committee. Uh, 46 was heard twice and sent to a committee, uh, but you know, is everybody okay just starting 42 and see where we end up? Yeah, I, I think we can get through it pretty quickly. Okay, so 42 was the proposal for the, um, is this 42? Yeah. And this is the modified version that uh, came out of the working group. So Tony, or who wants to talk I, about I this Go ahead, Tony. Yeah, go ahead. So, so essentially what we were trying to address was a use of master pressure reducing valves to fee, uh, supply sprinkler systems in high rise buildings. And so the working group did a really good job of modifying the language, incorporating the requirements out of NFP 14 that should be applicable uh, and laying it all out. Robert, I don't know if you have anything to add. Um, 
So I guess what we've done here is it is specific to high rise buildings only. And anytime you would have um, more than two sprinkler zones off a single um, pressure reducing valve, you would have to require um, uh, comply with the exceptions written there, which are basically the same as what's required for NFPA 14 in, in that situation. And your alternate to doing that is every zone gets its own pressure reducing valve. But which is what's been common in Denver for many decades. Yeah, I, I think for the part I struggle with a bit is um, in parking garages, you'll have five, say five dry valves on a single pressure reducing valve, all in the fire pump room. And then the what I would consider the appropriate way to design it is the the wet zones off the standpipe would each get their own pressure reducing valve. Tony explained at our last meeting that that's not what's happening in some cases with the with the wet systems, which I, I agree with not doing it that way. Um, the the dry valves in the in the pump room on a single PRV, I could go either way on that, but I guess at the end of the day, having more redundancy in a high rise is is better. Okay. Anybody from the public wishing to speak on this revision? So can you tell me, Robert or Tony, this is the revised version. What did you, is just this struck out per part is what you took out? That's correct. And then we okay. added all the underlying portion, obviously. And okay. we changed, changed the heading or the title. It used to be master pressure reducing valves. What I want to do is see if I have a copy of the, yeah, see, all I have downloaded is a copy of your amendment. I'm trying to see what the original motion or the original proposal was so that we could be clear of what the original and how it changed. Let me let me email uh, that to you, Sean. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sure I have it. I just didn't have it uh, pulled up. I, I can read it real quick. I have it here and it was pretty short. The short oh, was it? Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. It's essentially the, just the top. Go ahead, Robert, if you want to just. Yeah, I'm it. looking forward here. Give me a second. Oh, okay. I've, I've got it. Where master pressure reducing valves are used at the base of, uh, of riser or manifold locations, they shall be incorporating a redundant PRV arrangement in accordance with NFPA 14. It's the same code section? Yeah. But this has been significantly augmented. Mm -hmm. um, if I can just add one annoying thing. Technically, under the ICC process, titles of sections aren't enforceable. So I would simply recommend that you add in high-rise buildings after utilized in your actual code section. Thanks. I don't think I was at this meeting because I think this is when my uh, kiddo uh, busted open his lip. But was there any, has there been any discussion potentially limiting a single PRV to multiple floors to an area equivalent to the allowable area for a sprinkler zone per NFPA 13? Wayne, I, I thought about that when I was rewriting it and I just couldn't mm -hmm. I couldn't figure out a good way to write it, I guess. So I just landed on two two zones. I mean that's okay. simple. Sure, and I'm and I'm good with that. I just didn't know if there was if that was the in the intent kind of secretly behind the two zones, or if that made more sense for you know. I, I don't necessarily feel strongly one way or another. Just curious but, if there was thoughts. The I mean the issue I would have with that I guess is say you have a small a small floor plate that's ten thousand square feet, then you could have you know, five zones on a PRV right. um, versus a, if you have a giant four plate, you'd only have um, one. So I don't, I don't know. Okay. Anybody else? 
Is is the diagram going to be included on the amendments as well, or? Yes, I mean it, it's proposed to be included. Unless you guys tell us otherwise. I'm just going to look real quick to see if I can pull up. I might, I, I'm not seeing a reference to the figure, and it's uh, common practice that your, your section body would then reference you to look at the figure. That may be something, unless I'm missing that. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, so this was the old one. I just wanted to show you it so that people knew what was changing. So this all goes away and then it's replaced with the new wording. Um, when you are looking at your new wording, which is this one, um, where in here does it send you to that? To look at, you, like. Yeah, Glenn, that's a good observation. I don't think I included that, Shauna. Okay. So, I would put that figure under the exception at the end of the text of the exception. Yeah. See figure 903313312. I am not typing very good right now. I guess you could put it in parentheses. But. You could take out the word one, just say an example of. Um, all right, so let me, I need to highlight that I just changed that. and change that so that we have it as modified. We already have it as modified, so I guess it doesn't matter further modifying it, but the other one is what's posted and this was not. All right, any other discussion? What do, what do, we, what do we need to look at here? We have the original version. We have this version. Modified it a little. Could you go back to the figure real quick? How is how is that titled? One example. I would imagine you would just say example of master PRV arrangement because it is just a, an example. You have to say one example. And I wonder, Shauna, if we remove Matt, the word master since somebody in the prior meeting was concerned that that wasn't defined, what a master PRV was. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's not needed. Yeah, I would agree. And we're not using the term master anywhere else. Just take out master or just, it does just say example of PRV arrangement or example of a PRV arrangement. One example of a PRV arrangement. Just remove this. Is the working group okay with the deletion of the word one? I mean, I guess it doesn't yeah. really make a huge difference, but yeah. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I, I agree. It's not needed. Okay. How are we looking? We looking like somebody's gonna make a motion for as modified. Tony, make the motion to approve as <laughs> modified. <laughs> okay. I'll, 
I'll second. Okay, and Robert. All right, it's been moved and seconded for uh, as modified by what we see on the screen right now. Any further discussion? All right, I'm gonna call, let me see, nobody in the attendees got their hands raised or the public. So I'm gonna call the question for item number 42 as modified by what is shown on the screen right now. All those in favor? That is a big nine. All those opposed? Abstaining? All right, woohoo, we got through 16 items today. That is like a record. <laughs> it's awesome. We only have one item on our agenda that's going to be tabled and moved to the working group, which is item number 46. So I will forward to them the, uh, we have the original proposals, all the notes, and then the um, two revisions that you guys submitted. So we'll make sure that they get that. Um, make sure they have all the eyes modified and that we have the intent for the modification you approved for number 49 that Glenn and I'll write and Tony. So um, I think that we did a really great job. I think that's the most fire proposals we've ever got through in four, in four hearings. <laughs> hey, Shauna, any idea how many total proposals this committee did process total? Uh, you know, um, I probably could look it up on Teams uh, and, and oh, that's, that's see okay. how many we had. But um, we so only had, we just, out of all of the ones, we only had that one that we didn't get to because everything else we tabled and brought back and heard again. So we just, don't, out of all the proposals, only one we didn't get to. So I think, I think there was almost. I think 60. the number is 43. So not all of them passed, but you guys heard 43. That's a lot. So I think, Glenn, we had almost 60, if I remember correctly. So there's going to be maybe 17 that need to be processed. There were the still some. Yeah, there were still some that never made it on an agenda. You are correct. They never made it on an agenda because um, we knew we weren't going to get to them or they were brought in late. So, yeah. So there's probably at least a dozen probably that will go there's to seven. There's seven that you guys didn't see. Well, that yeah, Tony, I think a, a handful of that initial count, um, some of those got merged together. So we were able to reduce that count. Awesome. So Shana, what's great. the next what's the next step? Are they gonna are you guys gonna reach out and ask for volunteers for these meetings or do we yeah. have to contact somebody or what's what no do? um so Eric said that the city of Denver will reach out to everybody that was on a committee and see if they want to continue forward and be on the committee or attend meetings as they can. Um, so they're gonna reach out when they've decided when that's gonna be and, and how soon it's gonna be and everything. So they're gonna reach out to you automatically because you were on a committee. Um, and then they'll post it, a lot. they'll post it also for the interested parties that were involved throughout the whole process. So everybody will be notified once they figure it out. Okay, thanks. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys so very much. This was uh, great. It was uh, good. We got through a lot of proposals and we had a lot of great discussion, uh, even though we didn't follow Robert's rules, George. <laughs> <laughs> so thank this you very is, much. I appreciate it. It was highly technical. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, and Glenn, and Sarah. Thank you guys for proctoring this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah, and on, on behalf of Denver Fire and the city, thank you all. You volunteered many hours of yeah. your time and great efforts. Um, yeah. Consultants, been a lot of work coordinating. Thank you for your moderation or moderating, Shauna and Glenn. You bet. Yeah, I think it was a good effort thus far. Yeah, I think so. I think we did good. Um, all right. Well, you guys will hear from Eric. Uh, and Tony, you'll hear from Glenn and I as we try to <laughs> figure out number 49. So thank you everybody so much. Yeah. I, again, there's been enough thank yous, but I'm a big believer in the public being involved in, in the adoption of building codes. Um, so it's, I'm glad that you guys chose to do that. Thank you. Yeah, 
yeah, you will. Like Denver is one of, I help a lot of jurisdictions write their codes and Denver is one of very few that puts it out to a public process. And Denver is the only one that goes to this extent of a public process. So kudos to Denver. Yeah, it's really important. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.